Hey, Mike, welcome to the show. As way you get getting started, give us a little update on yourself. Uh, well, I've been in the uh, software and technology space for the better part of a 30-year career so far. Um, University of Florida graduate, go Gators. <laughs> and uh, spent a lot of time in the software space early on selling, managing teams, startups, uh, helped uh, four startups through IPO. And I also have run a strategy consulting firm for uh, over a decade down in the Southeast, uh, live in Denver today. Cool. And how'd you get in interested in sales? You know, it kind of found me. Uh, really? <laughs> out of school. I was an yeah. English major, a business minor. Yeah. And, uh, you know, last second decided not to go to law school and, uh, Good decision. yeah, a lot of people keep telling me that every day. Yeah. Um, so, uh, I wound up, uh, taking a class with a friend of mine. We were both learning to speak Italian because we both wanted to take our girlfriends on vacation to Italy. We were going to do it together. And it turns out somebody in our class, uh, was hiring kind of entry level salespeople and I got involved. Uh, I was doing some uh, early work with Lanier Worldwide um, and uh, got some good training, got recruited away to ADP and spent five years in both management and selling capacities there. Uh, still have good friends there that have made an entire career, but for me and many others, it was a great training, training stop around, friend. Yeah. Uh, learn how to qualify and certainly to hunt yeah. Uh, be accountable for, you know, revenue weekly. I mean, every single week, <laughs> you pay at 4 p.m. everywhere around the world, ADP people were, you know, testifying in front of Congress, right? Uh, yeah. <laughs> so I went on to enterprise software uh, right after that and uh, have had just a really nice run. You find some startups where you have good people, you can make and build good teams. And it's amazing what you can conquer when you get everybody sort of pulling the same flag up the same hill and how much friction you get when you don't have that and what yeah. you have to overcome. So we've all been there too, I'm sure. Well, let's talk about the best one. Which, which was your best experience? You know, I've been fortunate. There've been several, but uh, you know, early in my career, um, I spent a lot of time at a startup called Blue Martini Software. Yep, I remember Blue um, Martini. Yeah, and you know, I was an early guy there and we had a fantastic uh, head of sales uh, who was running global sales and just really believed in his people. Uh, he invested in his people. He wasn't a micromanager, but he was always there if and when you needed him and anything. Yeah. And he really worked hard doing the kinds of things that I try to do today on my management side, which is everybody in the company has to know that salespeople are not the punchline of the joke. Just because we have certain skills others don't, and we lack some that others have, it, salespeople are so vital to every part of life. And uh, I took a lot of good lessons from those days because I, I do some writing now, and I've written a few uh, blog entries where I, I, I titled one, Everybody's Selling Something, Even If It's Not in the Title on Their Business Card. Right. And... And, and that's a, a good perspective, but I, I like it, but professional selling, enterprise selling, business to business selling is a very different job, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. The, yeah. the, the skills cross apply though is, is really my only yeah. point. It's, you know, when you're building these relationships that take years, I mean, literally years in many cases to develop, and then sometimes you either leverage winning it's not like golf, you don't make a million dollars for coming in second, right? No, you don't. You either win or you lose. And some of these types of, especially in the old, you know, early go-go days in the ERP space, if you didn't win the deal, it was off the table for 10 or 20 years. Yeah. Right? So you really had to foster that relationship, but know when to really push and close the deal versus also knowing when you need to buy some time and not push, but build the relationship and cultivate some other aspect, maybe of the personal relationship. Yeah. And it sparks, and then you become a little more trusted as a sales professional. And you not only close that deal when the time comes, yeah. but then wherever you wind up going next, 80% of the time, those great relationships, you won't always get an immediate call back because everybody's busy. But when you reach out and you say, hey, Brian, I've moved on to a new space. 
we had a really nice history together, uh, helped each other a ton. Why don't we sit down and have a cup of coffee? I think there's something that can help you or you might be in a position to help me potentially. I'd like to pick your brain. Yeah. And a lot of those, you know, Fortune 500 relationships, they start with that, but they develop over time. And if you're good, they follow you from place to place. And that's been a very consistent perspective that I've heard from the very top, the top 1% of salespeople, the people making high six figures, low seven figures, is that they look at sales very differently, not as a transaction, but really a transformation of two companies coming together. Now, why did you move into leadership? Well, uh, leadership many years ago sort of found me, right? So I had started a consulting firm uh, with an old friend, and business partner, and it sort of found us. Um, um, You're getting found a lot. <laughs> yeah, no, this, this was a fantastic situation. I used to play in a men's basketball league in South Florida, and uh, Will Chamberlain had a sports bar in West Boca. Yeah. Um, so they sponsored our team. I became friendly with the manager, and, you know, they buy the T-shirts, and they – pay the annual fee for the league. And in return, you come in, you drink some beer and eat some chicken wings on Tuesday nights after your games. And they more than, you know, get all the branding back plus their investment. So a friend of mine was actually talking with one of our teammates over drinks and he was propositioned by a client to do some consulting work with him. And it was the exact same story, what happened to me and we just didn't know it. So we talked about it, approached the client, he was tired of paying back in those days, Anderson Consulting, $400 a partner hour, wow. okay? Yeah. And to go six months and get billed 100, 200, 300 grand, come back for the six month readout and the partner, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm affectionate to the consulting world because I've spent time in that world, I get it, and it's hard, but six months later, come back and tell the client what the client told you six months earlier. Yeah. So this gentleman, it was family owned business, mom and pop, and they were very frustrated um, with not getting results. So he asked me and, and a buddy of mine, different parts of his company to do some retained consulting work with them. He just thought we were young, smart guys, MBAs. Uh, we didn't, you know, BS him. And he said, come do some work. So he was very well connected in South Florida and, and basically started our shop. Um, we put a configuration engine in his plant software, which reduces downtime by almost 98%. So it saved them a ton of money, allowed them to build a new plant, and he introduced us to everybody he knew. Yep. So that, that spawned you know, almost 13 years of a good company. But I started realizing that I was pretty good at leading people. It's not easy every day. Um, and the biggest thing in startups when I went into leadership was – starting to appreciate that pulling the same flag up the same hill. Yeah. There are a lot of startup CEOs who are very bright men and women, but the, the sales organization still is the punchline of the joke at a party. And, and I, don't, I don't like that part. And I think that sales professionals are much, much more than that. Yeah. Because what I typically saw is I did nothing but startups you know, kind of at the series A on. And mm -hmm. what, what you found a lot of times with technical founders is they just wanted sales to work. Like, like they were outsourcing it almost. We yeah. built the mousetrap. You go find the people who need the mousetrap. And, and the salespeople are kind of right there in between and go, well, the mousetrap isn't what the market wants. It wants a little bit of this. Or we got to throw in some services with it. And I, I, the number of arguments I got in about, uh, you know, including services in the pre-sales process to get a big deal. You go, you got to charge for it. It's like, yeah, no one charges for a test drive, right? When you have an open house, you don't give a hundred dollars every time you go in, right? <laughs> can you imagine? <laughs> Who's going to show up? Oh, can I test drive the car that I want to buy? No, no. <laughs> no. Well, especially nowadays, if you take a look at all the studies done by the IT think tanks and consultancies, when somebody's evaluating a software purchase or a subscription, SaaS, you know, AI, whatever it is, when they're thinking about your business model and how it might help them, before they ever connect with one of your sales reps, they've done about 60% of their research already 
So they know a whole lot more than they ever did. So yes, there's some education, but what I used to really talk a lot about in my last company, because the perception and the reality were very different, yeah. it was a very good company offering a very good service, but because we were sort of the, the big elephant in the startup world of that space, which was replacing enterprise support, um, the last eight years were with Ramini Street, we competed with Oracle and SAP to replace the ERP annual maintenance contract. Sounds really easy. We charged half of what the big vendors charged. Yep. Save a company millions in guaranteed OPEX reduction right away. Yep. The challenge was it really wasn't a technology conversation. You had to win the day and show that your engineers are uber experienced, et cetera. But the real challenge was you have to discuss the difference between the buyer's perception of reality and the actual reality. Was it a big risk to make that change? Sure. Am I going to get exported by Oracle? Am I going to get sued by Oracle? The odds were very, very low, but it was a business conversation. And we needed people that could not be product marketers, but be business execs and have this kind of a dialogue and not always have to steer. They can just get to know people and figure out what's, what's on their mind and then figure out where to go from there. Because that brings up a great sales situation because I think too many people focus solely on money. <laughs> but, but in business to business, who cares about money? Whose money is it? Who, but whose life gets disrupted? Which is the personal wins always seem to find their way into these big deals. Well, they do. Uh, it, it's inevitable, right? Yeah. Because the, the kind of B2B sales you're talking about where you're dealing with career professionals that they're essentially relationship brokers, right? They understand the, the, the value, the collateral yeah. that comes with establishing quality relationships and protecting those relationships, but making sure that they spend a little bit more of their time nurturing those relationships, not just for selfish gain, because what goes around comes around. Yeah. Now, when you were leading reps, how could you tell what was a great rep and what was somebody pretending to be a great rep? <laughs> <laughs> it's not always that easy, right? Um, yeah. In certain places that I've been, it was easier um, in some ways. It was very apparent, the value prop, the skills that you needed. Uh, you sort of knew the leading indicators and a lot of those experienced enterprise technology software reps um, they knew that they could find a new home and sort of rinse and repeat based on their Rolodex. And I mean that in a good way. They knew what they knew. They know what they don't know. And they were focused at just leveraging quality, you know, large logo accounts time and time again. But the accounts, uh, I'm sorry, the reps that struggled, especially in my last stop, they really didn't understand what skills they were lacking. Yeah. Right. I, I, I'm very big, no matter where I've been, on a phrase that those who know me well will roll their eyes. It's you have to set the hook. And what do you mean by that? Well, for example, when you first meet somebody, let's say I'm out in the field and I'm with, uh, you know, one of my managers or my manager and a rep and we're out in the field. We have a couple of meetings that day and we're going into a fortune 500 company. It's a CIO and a CFO for a hundred billion dollar company. You can't just bond and you can't just hard press them. You have to set the hook and make it a compelling value for why they need to lean in and pay more attention, not just in that meeting, but after that meeting, because they're getting a thousand bits of white noise hitting their yes. inbox and their voicemail and social media every single week. Right. They're, they're so not at a shortage of ideas and things to spend time and money on. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, it's not like budgets are endless and time is certainly very finite. So I would seek, I would seek out the reps that really can set the hook. They think like entrepreneurs. They know how to contain a business within a business. You can trust them to go run, but then you can also trust that they're going to come to you and know when they need you, want you, and desire some of that help to sell together. 
Yeah. Because the value of you together is much more than individual. Uh, those people are like gold and they're yeah. great at what they do. And, and how could you tell that like in the interview process or in like the first 90 days, if they have that ability to set the hook as you described? Well, I, I found that the people that are good at team selling, it's pretty obvious by the behavior and the words and the way they talk about stories. You know, you ask somebody, give me a, give me an example of a great deal you sold. Yeah. And they talk about how their team pulled one down, even though they made $2 million in commission on that deal. <laughs> they were the AE and they should get handsomely rewarded yeah. with the biggest check. But at the same time, they're talking about their team. They're talking about how valuable the 19 different people who had to interact multiple times with them as the orchestrator. Um, those kinds of stories, when, there's, when they're talking about we and it's not all bragging I, 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 yeah. is a good leading indicator that they're not a lone wolf. Yeah. Uh, lone wolves are good in some places, some models, but in most of the enterprise technology worlds I've been in, you really need good quality team selling with many people involved. You do, because it, I look back at the biggest deals I've done. You know, I had engineers involved. I had my manager, my CEO, uh, my, my very first enterprise job. Me and the CEO were a sales team. I mean, his wife was in the hospital. He leaves his wife in the hospital to come out for a week to close out the quarter with me. Wow. And I was, I was essentially his uh, chauffeur. <laughs> I go, come on, Paul, let's go. Right. And we would go from account to account. And he'd call his wife in between meetings. But he was just magical. Yeah. And, and I think as a rep, to know how to use that orchestra of resources and how to prep them and contain them. You know, because I've had managers that I would never put in front of a customer also. Right. <laughs> you right. know. And I've had them open their mouths at dinner and say the dumbest thing possible. You know, if you ask, what yeah. would be the worst possible thing to say? Go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we've all been, you know, through that. But you know what? Another interviewing secret that I've learned is, and I wasn't very good at it early in my career. I got fortunate a few times, but still wasn't good at it until later, is when you interview for a C-level role, and you're meeting the founder, the CEO, you know, the whole C-suite that would be amongst your peers. I never really placed enough value in the startup world in my 20s on how important it was that the CEO was not only smart and he or she had good vision and decent management skills to orchestrate, you know, the entire company over time and can scale with them. Yeah. But number one, can you ever see yourself putting them in front of a customer? That's it. Yeah. And if the answer is no, then you dust off the resume and you go interview somewhere else. I, I can't agree with you more. I, I, there was one company where even the recruiters told me that the CEO was crazy, maniacal. And, and th that's fine to be like the technology leader, the, you know, the CTO, but as a CEO, could I put him in front of a customer? He would just ramble. And if it went wrong, he'd blame everyone but him. And, and it was a huge mistake. You know, I did okay, but it was like a year of uncomfortableness. And Well, those are, those are just struggles because, you know, you've probably told some of your own reps in the past the same thing. It's when the internal sale, so to speak, gets harder than the external sale. Yeah it's time to go unless you're just printing money in the back room and you're in a great spot and you'll stick it out for a while. Um, the internal sale has to be a little more frictionless. So I really try to spend time with a lot of the key people and, and all good managers do this. And it's hard because we have a day job, but it's socializing and yeah. befriending and understanding all the people that don't work on commission plans, but behind the scenes, whether they touch the customer as a prospect directly with you and your team or not, they're so vital to you successfully bringing in these large B2B deals that take years to build. And that, and that interest, that, that capital in the bank, so to speak, built up over time for caring about people, frankly. I like befriending my teams. 
And the people that I think good managers do that and they befriend their teams, sometimes that could cause problems because people make it too personal and they expect you to give them favors. We still have a job to do. That's the number one thing we're accountable for, but we can all appreciate and understand each other's lives and kids and yeah. the kids sick and you know, life happens. Do you know them as people? That's important to me. And that's it. And if you asked sales reps, what do they want from their sales manager? It's, you know, a little feedback's fine, but they really want you to be the expediter, the corrector, the fixer, you know, the, the Ray Donovan inside the company, right? The person who can get things done formally, informally, however necessary, so that the company does work for the reps. Right. And right. so few leaders get that. Well, and I find that there's also, you know, we talked about the importance of understanding, can you bring your, your CEO into a meeting? But another little trick that I sort of learned to look for when I'm meeting the, the balance of an exec team is, is there somebody who doesn't have sales in their job description, but has a title yeah. and is really good thinking on their feet, they're good with people, and in, in my own way of saying it, they can sort of be the Harvey Cattell and be the cooler that can come in and sometimes help settle things down, whether internal and just facilitate, right. or external and put them in front of a customer with a fresh face but an executive slant that, that, that feels good to the prospect or customer. Having that role is really key to scaling. If yeah. you have multiple people that can do that, then, then you're in a great spot too. That's it. And yeah, I kind of noticed the contrast between like Boston startups and Silicon Valley startups. You know, Boston startups tended to be much more territorial. Support never called the customer back. Marketing, you know, it was all finger pointing. Right. And the talk was always about who are we going to fire next? Oh boy, that, doesn't that bring up team spirit? <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> We'd be on the uh, on the, the the rental car bus back to the terminal after like a QBR, and we'd all be looking at each other, going, "Who's next?" And it's like that's not no way to build camaraderie or a team, right? You right. Know? Now, but uh, to your point, you know, as business gets tougher, and you go through sort of market roller coasters whether the stock market's up, but business is not so good or vice versa. There are, there are times when that swirl of whether it's layoffs or internal negativity seem to take over a company for a while. And that's another skill. Who can sort of work with their peers? Who can sort of massage everybody internally a little bit to make them feel good as teammates, yeah. but not get caught up six hours a day in stirring the gossip mill, right. which takes everybody away from being focused on working. Yeah. Um, you might have great, great people and they're really good at selling, but if the latest rumor mill, they have to be the one that's at the lead of who knows what, then that's a trade-off. You have to weigh sometimes, are those people better in the long term? I'd rather have the frictionless people who are really good at what they do. You know, they come out to a happy hour with their peers, they have a cocktail and then they have a life to lead. Right. Yeah. They're not out at three in the morning, you know, you know, seven bottles of you of, of wine later. It's a yeah. uh, drunk. I, I don't need people. the life of the party. <laughs> yeah. I need people who are reliable and they're cranking and they know their stuff and they, the day never has a beginning and an end yeah. and they filter their work life and their family life, their personal lives all into just being who they are and being comfortable in their skin. Those are really hard to find, as you know. Uh, so we kind of talked about what you're really good at. What skill would you have loved to been even better at that you think would take into your career even further? Um, boy, that's a great question. Um, <laughs> no, really. Uh, you know, I've gotten better at this as the years go by. But when I was maybe my first decade out of college, if you were destroying a business based on uh, a toxic attitude or 
you just flat out didn't know what you were talking about and everybody around you knew it, but you had the title and you were going to be the person who told everybody what to do. Uh, I usually called you out yeah. and, uh, and, and I'd make it very clear that that's just not acceptable and that's not a way to run a business or scale or, or, or create something that people are proud of. Now, you still have to find ways as you become older and a little more gray hair on the head. You have to find ways in private to talk with people to help them understand where they, I'm busy, so tell me what you need to tell me and then get out of my face because yeah. <laughs> I'm busy. But you mellow over the years and you get a little smarter, I think, over time. And, and I think being able to both give that feedback and take that feedback is critical. It's, it's the... It's the shortcut to success because we all have blind spots. Well, I'm the same to the same point. In my 20s, you'd give me some coaching and 50% of it, I would actually internalize. I was more of an introvert growing up and became more of an extrovert through a lot of the sales roles I, I've yeah. been in. Um, but I, I was a good listener as a kid. So I'd hear what you're saying and I'd absorb about half of it, but not all of it. Um, you get older. I like direct one feedback <laughs> because we're all busy. And right. if you feel like telling me something, tell me, because I need to be able to talk to you in somewhat of the same manner. Yeah. So that kind of exchange and ability to sort of be direct and blunt and then talk through it rather than fighting, just we might disagree, but let's, let's have that discussion because it shouldn't go on passive aggressively for a month. Right. Let's have it in 30 minutes over a coffee and move on. That's it, because so often in sales, there's no, I really only had one formal review in sales in my whole career. So, wow. <laughs> it, we're, we're, and, and it wasn't even face to face, it was kind of written. And, and you read it, and you, it was like it was just in circles. It wasn't really telling me anything, you know? And when I did get uh, a great manager who would share, you know, this is what you're doing right. This is what you're doing wrong. Very few, none were direct. They were all kind of beat around the bush. And so you had to elicit it. It wasn't, but yet when I became a manager, maybe I was too blunt. Right. You know, where you get a rep who, who won't shut up or talks over you or talks too much, too fast. And these, these things just won't work, right? You, you're going to save this person years of trial and error. Well, there has to be some kind of a middle ground, right? Yeah. So, you know, nowadays, you know, there are all kinds of complaints and there's HR for good reasons, right? When something is wrong that's going on in a company. But in most cases, you should be able to have a direct, blunt conversation that's professional and to the point about all the different gaps that people have in their learning. Yeah. And, you know, part of me is I get frustrated in like two to three year cycles if I'm not continually learning. Yeah, cool. I, I, I'm reading everything I can get my hands on. And if I don't have mentors around me, regardless of what my role is, I tend to get antsy. So I try to find the reps that are somewhat similar. It's, uh, it's hard to find, for sure. Cool. And, and how do you keep the, the wheels moving as far as developing yourself professionally? Reading, is it? Well, I, I, I read a ton. I read a lot of periodicals, um, subscribe to a, a, a ton of journals. Um, but I also have been doing some writing and especially during the time off, it's kind of reinvigorated some of that. Um, you know, um, are you familiar with Medium? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Great writing, uh, you, you know, sort of repository of everybody from really accomplished writers to people that just have something to share and topically you could find some really good, good things to not only read, but then trigger some thoughts about maybe something to contribute and give back. So I've been doing, you know, quite a bit of that. Cool. Hey, this has been a great conversation. Where can people go to connect with you and follow you? Uh, they can find me on LinkedIn. Um, got a full profile, uh, Mike Barron, again, based in the Denver, Colorado area. And uh, starting to evaluate, you know, what some next executive opportunities would be after taking some time off from the last one. So, Brian, really appreciate your time. It's, a, it's, it's nice to talk to you and look forward to following up.